Hi, welcome to Trojan Corner. Today we are reading The History of Counting by Denise Schmant Basserat. Introduction. A number is a word that expresses how many. Counting is reciting numbers in order. Counting the ducklings on the pond, for example, means reciting one, two, three, four, five, as each duckling swims by. The last number tells how many ducklings are on the pond. Surprising as it may seem, people did not always have numbers. For most of their time on Earth, in fact, modern humans had no numbers. Imagine not having numbers. What would life be like without counting? Today, numbers play an important role. We use them in many ways. They show the price of things, tell the hours of the day and the days of the month, mark the houses on the street, make it easy to find the right bus or dial the telephone, identify cars and tell the players of a team apart. In this book, you will discover how the numbers 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and the system of counting that uses them were invented. Today, people of most areas of the world, including North and South America, Europe, Asia, Africa, and Australia, share the same efficient counting system. With only these 10 digits, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, we can make up any number that we want. Our way of counting is not the only one though. There are people in some parts of the globe who do not count the way we do. In the recent past, the Vedas of Sri Lanka who live by eating the fruit and tubers of the jungle plants had only a few general words, such as single, couple, another one, and many, to deal with numbers. Because of their simple way of life, the Vedas got along just fine without numbers. When a Vita wished to count coconuts, for instance, he collected pebbles. For each coconut, he took a pebble. One coconut equaled one pebble. For each pebble, he counted another one. When he was finished, he pointed to his pile of pebbles and said, that many. The way the Vedas counted is called counting without numbers. What is it good for? Whenever the Vita wanted to, he could check if his pile of coconuts was complete just by comparing it with the pile in the pebbles. Other people never created special words for numbers. For example, the Paila, who cultivated orchards in the highlands of Papua New Guinea, counted by pointing to parts of their body. The number one was the left little finger. 11 is the left neck. 16 is right ear, etc. This way of counting is called body counting. When the Paila go to the marketplace, they trade and bargain by pointing to their fingers, wrists, elbows, shoulders, neck, and nose. At the same time, they say the word for the part of the body. This way of counting is sufficient in communities that have no use for large numbers because the people themselves produce most of the food and things they need. The largest number of the paella is 28, shown by two hands clenched together. Body counting must have been quite widespread around the globe as late as the 1800s. It was also used, for instance, by native peoples of Paraguay, South America, whose largest number was 20, shown by pointing to the two feet. When and why people invent body counting? No one knows, because there is no record of how it came about and for what purpose. The past of people who, like the paella, have no writing may soon be forgotten. However, body counting tells us an important fact. The idea of using numbers as special symbols did not happen by chance. The fact that some peoples never created special words like two and three shows that numbers had to be invented. Still, other peoples count concretely. This means that they use different sets or groups of numbers to count different categories of things. For example, the Gilyaks, who farm along the river Amur in eastern Russia, have 24 sets of numbers. When a Gilyak counts trees, sticks, pencils, and some other long things, she uses the word mex for the number two. When counting leaves, pieces of textile, or other flat items, she will use met for two. And for berries, balls, and other round things, two becomes mick. Note also that the Gilyak's number sequence never reach beyond 20. In other words, concrete numbers do not allow large quantities to be counted. Concrete counting shows how societies around the world faced the problem of handling polarity, or groups of many items, and found different solutions to express numbers. The concrete numbers are similar to our terms twins, triplets, 
quadruplets, which refer to the number of children of the same birth, and duo, trio, quartet, which refer to the groups of musicians. Both number words, twins and duo, indicate two, but in neither case does the word separate the number from the thing that is being counted. The most universal way of counting, the one the majority of people use today, is known as abstract counting, using abstract numbers. We separate, or abstract, the idea of one, two, three, and so on, from the thing that we are counting. This system is very convenient because abstract numbers count anything. Each abstract number is expressed by a word that remains the same no matter what is being counted. This is not so with concrete numbers. In that system, number words are limited to counting small amounts, only certain types of common things of daily life. Another advantage is that abstract numbers are infinite. For example, our largest numbers are the Google, a one followed by 100 zeros, and the Googleplex, a one followed by a Google of zeros. But if we ever needed to count beyond these numbers, we could keep adding zeros, like this. Mathematicians think that abstract counting developed over a long period of time. Some suggest that the evolution of counting may have happened in three steps. One, counting without numbers. Two, concrete counting. And three, abstract counting. Ancient objects used for counting found in the Middle East support this idea. The earliest counting devices are notched bones that were found among the remains of hunters and gatherers who lived about 15,000 years ago in what is now known as Middle East. Although we do not know what these ancient people counted with the notched bones, these counting devices may tell how they counted. Because each notch is similar to the next one, and because there never seems to be a total indicated on the bones, it is likely that the hunters and gatherers had not yet developed numbers. Each notch probably stood for, and one more. The counters found in the villages and towns built by farmers between 5,000 and 10,000 years ago were small tokens of many shapes. Each token shape was used to count only one type of thing. For example, sheep were counted with discs, but jars of oil were counted with egg-shaped tokens. We know this because the signs for sheep and oil in early Sumerian writing pictured a disc and an egg shape. The fact that each different type of item was counted with a different shaped token suggests that the early farmers had different sets of numbers to count various things. They counted concretely. They used the tokens by matching them with the number of things they counted. One sheep was shown by one disc, two sheep by two discs, and so on. We owe the invention of abstract numbers to the Sumerians who lived in the first cities in the region of present-day Iraq about 5,000 years ago. The Sumerian tablet in the man's hand shows an account of 33 jars of oil. The sign on the right stands for jar of oil. The other signs represent numbers. Each circle is 10 and each long sign is 1. More on the Sumerian counting system, see page 24. Why is the counting system different from others? For the first time, numbers and things counted were separated or abstracted. Sheep and jars of oil were finally counted with the same numbers. Why did it take thousands and thousands of years to invent abstract numbers? Why weren't they invented sooner? It is not a question of intelligence. The size of your brain is the same as that of a child who lived 50,000 years ago. Probably it was a matter of need. The simple life of hunters and gatherers required little counting since these people lived on the animals they caught or the plants and fruits they gathered daily. The fact that it is the first farmers who invented tokens suggests that domesticating animals and plants made counting necessary. It makes a lot of sense that counting became important when the life of a community depended on knowing how many bags of grain to keep for planting the next harvest and how many animals would feed the village during the winter season. There can also be no doubt that abstract counting was invented to cope with the development of business, trade, and taxes in the first cities. A more precise method of counting became necessary once workshops produced quantities of pottery and tools. But it was the tax system that had the biggest impact on counting. Every month, each Sumerian had to deliver the ruler-specific amounts of fish, oil, grain, and animals. Because of this, the palace accountants had to come up with a way to keep track of large amounts of goods. 
The three steps in counting, therefore, were responses to the new demands brought about by the increased complexity of life. Once abstract numbers were invented, they were used more and more widely in trade and in calculations needed for everyday life. And in the greater use of numbers also came the need of larger and larger numbers. In the country of Sumer, the most common large number that was used in everyday life was 60. It was called the big one, which suggests that at some time it had been the highest number. But by 2500 BC, the Sumerians' largest number had grown to 36,000. It was probably used very rarely and then only by palace accountants to calculate tax collections. It is much the same for our large numbers today. The Google and the Googleplex were invented in the 1950s by mathematicians who needed to do very large calculations. But we never use these large numbers in daily life. The largest numbers we read about in newspapers are in the trillions. One trillion is a one followed by 12 zeros. Signs to represent numbers are called numerals. The Sumerians had distinct signs to represent 1, 10, 60, 600, 3600, and 36,000. The remaining numbers were shown by repeating these signs. For instance, the sign for 1 was a long wedge, and the numbers 2 through 9 were shown by 2 to 9 wedges. The number 10 was a circular sign, and 20 through 50 were shown by 2 to 5 circular signs. The number 60 was a large wedge. In Sumer, reading a numeral like 23 meant counting how many circles or wedges were included in the numeral. The numbers 10 and 60 were special in Sumer because they were bases. Bases are numbers to use to create higher numbers. The Sumerian large numbers were multiplications of these numbers. 10 times 60 equals 600. 60 times 60 equals 3600. 60 times 60 times 10 equals 36,000. Why did the Sumerians give such importance to 60? Because this number has a unique advantage. It can be divided equally in many ways. The number 60 is divisible by 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 10, 12, 15, 20, 30, and 60. This is why we have hours of 60 minutes and minutes of 60 seconds. If one hour was divided into 10 minutes, it can be divided equally in only four ways by 1, 2, 5, and 10.